Hey guys, welcome to another best, uh, episode of the Best Practices Show. I'm your host, Kirk Barron, and you are listening to the number one podcast for dental practice owners, where we come to you every single week with dentistry's best experts on proven practical tips, tools, and coaching everything you need to know about running a great practice, because we want you to have a great practice and a great life. And today is no exception. I got my good friend, Dr. Lenny Hess from the Dawson Academy. You are going to absolutely love this. Uh, so do me a favor, grab a pen and hit the share button. You're going to see what great practices are doing post COVID and thriving or killing it and see why some practices are struggling. So if you're joining us for the first time, I want to do two things. Number one, I just want to congratulate you for showing up. We're just a community of regular people that care a lot about this profession and just keep learning all the time. So you're going to find yourself in a pretty fun group of people. And then lastly, I, I want to uh, thank you for showing up and uh, ask you to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it be Google uh, Google Play, Stitcher, iTunes. I don't even know all of them, but you want to make sure you want to subscribe because we're going to be coming to you every single week with a new expert in dentistry to give you the best practices we see anywhere. And lastly, we take a lot of notes here. So pay attention when you do subscribe, you're going to see you're going to get all the show notes, the links, everything that we share during these shows. And also, I want to encourage you to keep sending us suggestions. I know I got a ton yesterday, and I just really appreciate this. We're lining up some of the best guests, some of our favorites of all time in the weeks to come, where we want to bring you great programming where you get the most out of it. Uh, so I want to introduce my guest today. Lenny, you have been a great friend of the ACT Dental community for many years, and you're a part of a near dear community that we love. And today we're going to be talking about a great subject that I love, 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 love. But I always want people to know who Dr. Lenny Hess is or who our guests are today. And number one, you got cool hair. You're a smart guy. Like, I mean, every, every, you probably put gel in it and all that kind of stuff. But no. um, and you've, you've done unbelievable things, not only for the dental community in people that have gone to the Dawson County, but you also hosted one of the most unbelievable experiences for us ever, which was your uh, Napa Valley uh, experience that you gave the act dental community. We're going to have to do that again whenever we can. But uh, I want people to know, who is Dr. Lenny Hess? Let's start there. Well, Kirk, it's great to be here with you. It's great to be back. Um, you know, I think the last time I was with you was during our COVID shows that you were running every day. And um, so thanks to you for that and supporting the dental community, because we really were all in a really stuck place there for a couple of months. You know, so many of us were living with fear and apprehension, and we were just worried every single day. And I think a lot of people had a lot of comfort and distraction and, and, and um, high quality distraction, the fact that they were learning something every day. So I want to just thank you for what you've done for the dental community over all the years, and especially the support that you showed practicing clinicians during the COVID stuff. So as far as who I am, well, you know, the biggest thing like I always try to tell people is that I'm a, I'm a general dentist that I practice in a very kind of normal type of setting in America. I practice in Union County, North Carolina, where the biggest industry in the county is, is growing and farming chicken so you can have Chick-fil-A sandwiches. And, um, you know, so I'm, I'm a dentist who's passionate about uh, doing dentistry. I'm also very passionate about educating. I've been very committed to continuing education very early on in my career. And I was so inspired as a, as a dentist when I was um, going to Northwestern University in Chicago. You know, I live right downtown. I had access. I lived my the apartment building that I lived in was right next door. It actually joined the headquarter for the ADA. And so I had so much access to amazing dental speakers between that and the midwinter meeting every year in Chicago that I got so inspired even at a young age that, you know, the vision that I really kind of uh, put myself on the path that I was trying to put myself on even back then was I will someday I, I, I saw myself as someday wanting to be able to to be a good enough clinician and educator that one day that I could be able to have the honor and the privilege to be on the stage to help other dentists get better at what it is that they do. And that's what really those are the things that I love. And the other thing that I really love if people know about me is that, you know, I always tell people that I have my philosophy when it comes to dentistry is that I'm, I'm working to live, not living to work. And uh, and I love to make sure that my dental practice is conduit to allow me to have um, 
everything that I want outside of dentistry as well, whether it includes hobbies, time with my family, um, being able to pursue all the wonderful opportunities that we can have that makes dentistry even more rewarding. So what I would tell people is I'm a, I'm a general dentist. I'm experiencing the same struggles and the same hardship and the same issues that every other general dentist it, it is out there. I've had the, the I've been very blessed in the fact that I've been able to make a very nice career for myself and enjoyed a lot of a lot of clinical success and a lot of lecturing success. And, um, you know, I'm just very passionate about helping people get better at what it is that they do. Yeah, and you do an excellent job of it. Now, I also want you to talk about something that's very near to both of our hearts. You're a senior, senior faculty member at the Dawson Academy. Now, that's where I got my start. Uh, a lot of what I know about dentistry is just a, a very incredible human being by the name of Dr. Peter Dawson. Unfortunately, we lost him last year. Mo many viewers or listeners that are listening know who Dr. Peter Dawson is, but give us some perspective on what the Dawson Academy is all about. What is it? What do you guys do? Well, you know, the, the, what we do is we grow on a foundation that was laid by Dr. Dawson. You know, Dr. Dawson, those of you who, who ever had the, the great pleasure to meet him or spend time with him, we all know him as one of the greatest human beings that's ever lived because he was so compassionate, so caring, so giving. And, and more than anything, Pete really cared about making sure that our patients were getting the best possible care that they could get. And, you know, Pete always talked about the philosophy that if you if you do something you love and you do it at a high level, the money will follow you, that we don't have to be as as dentists. We don't have to be out there being salespeople or trying to trying to emotionally manipulate people into doing things that we want them to do, but always do things that's best for them. And so, you know, Dr. Dawson, you know, he wrote the book we all know that nobody has sold more dental textbooks in the world than Dr. Dawson. And some of the most highly regarded textbooks on occlusion and function and aesthetics were written by Dr. Dawson. And, you know, so he became so popular as he really became, um, you know, basically the guru or the godfather of occlusion and, and modern mythology. And so many of the things that we take for granted in our profession, so many of the concepts that we that we talk about from a functional standpoint and also from an aesthetic standpoint, a lot of these were really um, discovered or refined by Dr. Dawson. And, you know, he became so popular that he formed the Academy back in 1979. And really, most of the big names that you know in dentistry these days, a lot of them got their start learning and teaching with Dr. Dawson. And so what we do as an academy is, you know, what, what one of our slogans is we're trying to make good dentists better. And we're trying to support clinicians to achieve what it is that they want. What are their dreams for being a dentist? And, you know, there's a lot of frustrated dentists out there, Kirk. You know, you experience them. You see that the challenges that dentists are having, and, and it even relates back to what we're going to talk about today, which is what's going on in your practice post COVID. Cause I'm out in the road and I'm, I'm starting to, to get back into live teaching again. And I'm starting to talk with a lot of dentists and, you know, there's, there's basically two groups that I'm encountering right now in the profession. I have half of the people that I know that are absolutely killing it. They're putting out their best numbers that they've ever done on a monthly basis. And then I also have some friends that are that have practices that are just very insurance based, very PPO founded in um, in the way that they provide their care, and they seem to be struggling right now. And you know what what do I see is the difference? The difference is um, you know how you're looking at the business. Are you really are you really gearing your practice in your practice growth around an insurance based model or are you are you really kind of trying to grow your practice based on a wellness based model and there's two different two two distinctly different models of dentistry you know one is a is a model that every decision that we make seems to be based on what's best for the insurance company and the other model is making decisions on what's best for the patient Right. And when it comes to when patients are ready to spend money, and right now it's amazing because patients are really ready to spend money. Yeah. You know, they, ha they have disposable income because you know what? They're not taking trips. You know, they're not spending money on things that they would normally be spending it on. So now they're looking at it as an opportunity. Hey, if I can't go do these things that kind of give me instant gratification, let me invest some of this money on something that I've been thinking about with regard to my health. Yeah. Now, it's so funny you say that, too, because I'm actually going through a mini depression right now because I'm the guy that always has a vacation scheduled. Well, I don't have yeah. any of that. Yeah. And neither 
patients. And yeah. there's got to be, I forgot, I stopped counting the number of dumpsters that are on my street of people that are like just redoing their houses or redoing a bathroom or, you know, so it's very important to understand this is kind of a false positive as far as money goes for, you know, consumers in the United States. They have discretionary income. A lot of them are paying mortgages. They aren't going on vacation. So they're spending money on things that they want to get done. And it includes dentistry. Now, let's go through the narrative here, too, because you and I, if you're a young dentist watching this, you might have experienced this. And Lenny, you and I were talking this. Like, I panicked when this first happened. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And then, you know, like you said, and some of these things that we're going to be talking about, killing it or destroying it, they were issues before, but it kind of got really exposed when we went back to work. You know, a lot of us were sitting on our hands. And we we're like, it's the right thing to do not to work. But take us through the psychology of what a restored dentist or some of the you know, students you see, see at Dawson through the shutdown and then as they were getting back up, what were you hearing from a lot of these docs? Well, absolutely. Everybody had fear because none of us have ever gone or experienced, experienced something like this. You know, I've been in practice now for 21 years and I've been through two or three different recessions uh, and economic downturns. But, you know, the reality is every time there is an economic downturn, I'm still able to go into my office and do my job. Mm -hmm. And uh, but now here now we've got a completely unique scenario to where we you know, it was almost an instantaneous change in the economy. People going out, you know, staying home, not going to work, us being being encouraged to not go into our offices and practice. And so that was just a whole different level of fear and anxiety because, you know, now we're not able to go into work. We all know that we have overhead that still needs to get paid. You know, we, our bills still got to get paid. Our rent still has to get paid. All these things still have to occur, yet we're not able to go in there and actually be be proactive and be productive about what it is. And then, of course, we always have these fears like, well, how are our patients going to react? Are they going to come in the door? Are they going to be apprehensive? Are they going to be fearful when they come in? Are people going to be really panicking about spending money thinking, well, is my job on the line? So it was it was a completely unique set of circumstances but the interesting thing, I'll tell you what I experienced was uh, in my practice, I am constantly doing what I call planting the seeds of implication. And this is something that I learned from Dr. Dawson about 20 years ago. And what he talks about is making sure that you are you're taking the time and you have the relationship with your patients that you can start to discuss what are your long term concerns for this patient's oral health. And if you talk about those, if you start to kind of paint the picture, so if you're going to, if you're going to plant that seed of implication, what I mean by that is number one, just expressing concern mm -hmm. because we have so many patients that they feel like now the standard of care in dentistry is based on the insurance model. So what does that mean? Well, I have $1,500 or $2,000 a year benefits and, and I'm going to spend that and whatever whatever needs to be done after that is just going to, to get delayed or deferred into the next calendar year. But most of our patients, we know that their health needs usually far exceed what insurance benefits will pay for. And especially if the patient may have been MIA, maybe they haven't been the dentist for three or four or five years, you know, because they were in between jobs or they didn't have the time. And, uh, and the next thing you know, you miss one or two recare appointments and you walk in the door and the next thing you know, four years have gone by. And so those patients come in and they're a lot of times the frustrated patients because um, dentistry is expensive. And, you know, a lot of times patients, they, they recognize expensive. They always feel we're too expensive, but patients don't really have any idea how much it costs to actually provide the level of service um, that is necessary for standard of care in most dental practices. Right. And um, so, you know, planting those seeds of implication and, and allowing patients, allowing us to be compassionate with our patients, because, you know, when you really start to to dig into the deeper levels of health and wellness with our patients, a lot of times they're hearing things for the first time they're, They may be overwhelmed by the fact of how sometimes how severe things can be in their in their dentition. And then also it's expensive. And so that's the, our opportunity to to be compassionate, to love on our patients and to keep watering those seeds that we planted, our seeds of implication. And and what we're going to do is we're going to allow time for the patients to come to grips with what it is that needs to be done, allow them to take ownership of what their situation is. And now they have a choice. And yeah. so 
it's amazing how when we plant the seeds of implication, we water them with love and compassion, they start popping through the soil. And so what I saw in my practice was I had all these patients that I've just been loving on and giving them time to, to come to grips with things. And we came back in the office and boom, they were just popping through the soil, ready to do something because they, that time when they were home with their families, um, you know, it's amazing how there are a lot of people that got more focused in on their own personal health when they were at home for two months and they really kind of saw what mattered. Yeah, absolutely. I love when you say seeds of implications. There's so many things I appreciate about you guys as great facilitators, instructors, mentors for the rest of the industry. You know, one of the things that Dawson Academy does so well among many things is the whole idea of diagnostics, like just constantly being able to see it and giving dentists the clinical confidence. But if you had that before and you were always having these conversations, it was a very forward focused conversation with patients and less an emergency type based conversation. Let's also talk about, I think we have to talk about this too, because, you know, you might be killing it and you might be thinking, gosh, these are my biggest months ever, but let's never lose sight of the fact that this could be just a little blip in the radar that could go away over time because you haven't been working the schedule, haven't had the diagnostic conversations, the seeds of implications, watering them the right thing. I mean, this is, we're talking about the simple little disciplines that make a great restorative practice and they got exposed if you weren't doing them beforehand. Another thing that got exposed is if you didn't love your team, that really got exposed, mm -hmm. you know, because the dentists that did the best when they came back, they had their teams back for the most part. Do you know what I mean? Type of a thing. So there's a lot of different layers to this. Um, but I also want you to talk about the other side. Let's go to the other side. When you see people that are struggling, you mentioned insurance. Tell us more about that. Like, you know, if somebody's watching this and they're like, Lenny, I'm really struggling right now and I'm all PPO, let's 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 paint some some clarity on that. Why is that happening right now? Well, you know, the thing the thing to always remember about insurance is that if you when I talk to dentists and I say, what's the biggest frustration that you have in your practice? The number one thing, without a doubt, the number one thing is insurance, right? Because dentists are, you know, a lot of times we go to dental school and we, we have this great motivation because we want to help people and it's going to be a very fulfilling and rewarding profession. And then usually, you know, I meet a lot of dentists that are 10, 12, 15 years down the road in their practice, and they're just so frustrated. And the frustration is insurance because insurance is absolutely the greatest obstacle that we have in maintaining a great relationship with our patients. Right. You know, the insurance industry, they're trying to do what? They're trying to dictate fees. They're trying to control what it is that we can charge for a procedure. Now, they're also getting in the way because they now can sit there and deny treatment. And nobody likes dealing with EOBs. Nobody likes performing a, a, a necessary clinical procedure and then find that the patient gets a letter from the insurance company saying that, that their independent review or cons, con, you know, consultants determined that it wasn't a necessary procedure. And what does that do? Well, it wrecks the relationship we have with our patients because now the patients are coming back to us and because it's something that's generated around money, and then money is an emotional trigger point for most every single human being on the planet, because it's revolved around benefits and money and what the patient is going to be responsible for, now they feel like we're doing something wrong because this kind of authority, being the fact that they're an authority because they're a corporation, all of a sudden they said that this treatment wasn't necessary. And it's so demeaning and it's so... Um, it's so psychologically damaging for a lot of us because we know we're providing the care that's necessary and that our patients need. And, and the insurance company, they may have this consultant in there and it may not even be a dentist. It could be somebody right. that was like the Subway sandwich artist of the month, the month before. And now they're in there working for a dental insurance company and looking at x-rays or something. And, and they're determining whether or not a procedure is clinically necessary or not. Right. Or they didn't win the award as sandwich artist of the year and they were less of an employee than that. But like you're painting a very important thing. Now, I would let me ask you this. It's also not healthy for us to just get angry at insurance companies, no, look, you know, it, and it's like it's telling, not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. We always say like, you can wish it was easier or you can try to get better. Like there's two ways to look at it type of a thing. And you guys do this all the time. Well, yeah, it's all a matter of how you look at it. Look, I think it's great that patients have dental insurance because it's a benefit. It's money in their pocket that helps them to move in the direction that they need to go. You know, 80% of my, 80% of my patients have dental insurance 
And would, my, would I have as many patients or would they be willing to do treatment as much if they didn't? Well, the answer to that is no. Well, so 80, not, 80%, wait, 80%? You're an instructor and you don't have this like fee for service practice where people come in with wads of money and say, hey, can you just do all these? Because I think that's a misnomer a lot of people think. Well, Lenny, you teach gorgeous dentistry. Your patients can afford this. You live you know, off of Park Avenue in New York City. No, you have, it's very important to know, like you're a real guy. This is, these are real patients. These are real issues, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Like I said, 80% of my patients have dental insurance. Now they're using their insurance based on a fee for service practice model to where the patients are going to pay what insurance doesn't pay in my practice. And you know, that does that offer, is that like the easiest thing in the world? Well, no. And you know, the great analogy that I always give give everybody is, you know, I used to be guilty of this when I was a younger dentist is where I would go to these CE courses. I would be learning how to do complicated dentistry, learning how to do aesthetic dentistry, these types of things. And I would be looking at these patients. And I would think, well, gosh, I don't have these patients in my practice, or it must be that the fact that this dentist, you know, lives in a wealthier, or the practice is in a wealthier area. And that this, it's a complete illusion. It's an absolute illusion because the most important thing that we have to do is remember that we're in the people business. And if people don't like us, if people don't trust us, they're not going to choose to do the dentistry with us. Right. And so the great example is a lot of times I'll be teaching courses, hands-on courses at the Dawson Academy, and we'll be talking about implementation. And we'll be talking about what do we have to do in our practices to become a complete care dentist? And what changes do we have to make in the way that we have patients come into the office, the way that we do a diagnosis, the way that we allow the diagnosis to lead us to a treatment plan that's appropriate, and how do we change the, the way that we do things? And so one of the most common conversations that a dentist will bring up to me, and they'll say, well, geez, Lenny, look, you don't have the challenges that I have in my practice because you're not in network. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell them, I say, well, let me, let me go ahead and bust your bubble right now and give you the unfortunate truth. As I said, if I have, if 80% of my patients have dental insurance and, and 80% or maybe a little bit more of your patients have dental insurance, they have a commonality between the two of them. Right. And what is that? And they'll think about it for a minute and they'll be kind of looking at me in a puzzled way. And I'll say the reality is that they have a maximum limit mm -hmm. to whether or not you're in network or out of network. If the, if the maximum amount of benefit is $1,500 a year, it is. That's right. all it is. So at that point in time, it doesn't matter whether my your patients in network or out of network or mine is. It doesn't matter. The difference is in how we go about managing those patients. Yeah. Are we are we showing concern? Are we doing a complete examination to where we can I, we can diagnose the entire system? Can we get the patient to take ownership of what their problems are? And at the end of the day, it, it's based on education, giving the patients the opportunity to choose. And then allowing, and then us, number one, not being attached to whatever the patient decides, yeah. right? So one of the greatest harms that we, that we encounter as dentists is that we become attached to the decision that a patient makes, that we allow our self-worth to be attached to whether or not that patient says yes or no. Right. And the greatest freedom that I would encourage any dentist to take is to do your job at the highest level, which means do a complete examination Make sure you communicate with your patient. Make sure that they have the right to choose the highest level of care. And if they choose not to, let that be their decision. And if I do all that, I'm not going to attach my self-worth to whatever that patient decides. Yeah, that's powerful you said that because actually Bob Margis, who we both love, we were texting about you this morning, you know, and uh, it's so important what you just said, that mental state, because a lot of our self-worth, self-approval is, uh, is based on how well people like us. And you've taught this forever. Bob teaches this. He said, I say this all the time. I love what he says to patients. It's three things. It's your money. It's your mouth. It's your time. I'm here to tell you the truth. I'm just the referee. You get to make all the decisions. And that's really what you're talking about, Lenny, is just always be committed to the truth and helping patients the right way. And really, you know, focusing on where you want to go with the practice and not letting the winds of the world push you in a certain direction where you wake up and you go, I don't like these reimbursements. I don't like the whole shared agreement thing. I get angry whenever I hear that insurance company's name. You know, really a dentist just has to start setting sail and deciding on how they want. And then you got to help everybody around you. Like you, you, you know, as a dentist too, part of killing it is you got to communicate this with your team. 
like on a regular basis. This isn't about you just getting better clinically. This is a whole practice philosophy, right? Absolutely. Well, your staff members are the foundation. And if, if your staff members don't see the value in what it is or the level of care that you provide, that's going to be something that the patients can perceive. Right. You know, if, if you're sitting there and you're making recommendations toward, towards a patient and you walk out of the room and the patient kind of looks and sees that you left the room, then they turn to the assistant and say, listen, do I need to do any of this? Does, what, what do you think about all this? And if the, if the assistant's like, well, I don't know, I guess so, maybe, you know. Yeah. Chances are they're probably not going to be that enthused about what it no. is that you just said when you're not being backed up or supported by the staff member in there. So, yeah, staff training is, is so, so important. It's critical. Like, you can't present a treatment plan and they go, what do I do? And you go, I know. He's really expensive. You can't have that. <laughs> well, I mean, we're, know, we're joking tongue in cheek, but that's yeah. what patients don't care what comes out of here. It's your eyes that tell the whole story. And so, you know. Well, exactly what you just said. You know, Kirk, as you're saying, well, they're like, well, is, is he expensive, right? Well, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier. Money is such a trigger for so many people, sure. whether it's us, whether it's our patients, whether it's our staff members, right? So if you, you know, if you have a, if you, if you get done going over a $25,000 treatment plan with a patient and the patient is kind of has that glass look in their face and they're just, they don't know what to think and, you know, and, and they're, they're go up to the front desk and they start working with somebody at the front desk and that front desk person is making 27,000 or $30,000 a year. And the patient says to them, boy, gosh, you know, 20, $25,000 case, that sure is a lot of money. Boy, you better believe it. I don't know how in the world you can pay for this. Who, who can pay for this stuff? You know, it's. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have to, you know, and part of the education process is we all start to value it together. Winning in a dental practice requires collective winning. We all have to win together. This isn't about one or the other. And the other thing that I love about you guys, and you're probably seeing this with a lot of dentists and we are too, is in the midst of COVID, when we went back to work, we had all the stuff. We had all the stuff all over here. You had to put new things on. Now we're talking about different kinds of masks. I mean, I don't know how many of these I have in my pockets everywhere. And I'm not even doing dentistry at a regular basis, but we, we got so focused on the new that we were dropping a lot of the little things that we did before that were essentials for a great restorative practice. And so, you know, I think more now than ever, it's really important, no matter where your practice is at, today start deciding, like, how am I going to move forward? Dentistry is not going to go through another shutdown. But in order to thrive in the future, I think it's essential that you have to start moving into what you're talking about, a more, you, you used the word before, when you said a patient-centered model. Can you give some, spread some light on what that truly is? Well, you know, the beautiful thing about a patient-centered model is, um, Kirk, is that the, having that attitude and that philosophy of care, it actually increases the predictability and the profitability of your practice. And, and what I mean by that is that so much of the things that bewilder us or frustrate us as dentists are when we have failures that we don't understand why they failed or we have patients that we can't get comfortable, that we can't relieve their symptoms. And most of this really comes from a lack of ability to diagnose. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the ability, let, let's back it up and talk about the, the reason why we got trapped or boxed into the corners that we're in, is when we go to dental school, we were trained to diagnose bacteria, and that's it. We were taught to diagnose bacteria, whether it's related to periodontal disease, or we were taught to diagnose uh, bacteria related to occlusal caries or caries in, in our teeth. So, you know, most of our patients that have extreme difficulties when it comes to longevity and maintaining their health, a lot of it is functionally based. It's joint based, it's muscle based, and it's occlusally based. And very few of my big restorative cases that people need a lot of dentistry to get them healthy again, very few of these patients having a majority of the what's what's causing the problem, a majority of it being bacterially based because of decay or, or periodontal disease. Now, it's not to say that those people aren't out there. They are. But primarily in dental school, we were taught to, to we were taught to diagnose bacteria. Well, now we get out into clinical practice. And, you know, what do you what do you have to do to, to get a, a, a licensure in a state? Well, you have to pass an examination of minimal competency, which means can you do a class two amalgam or composite? Yes. Can you do a class three? Yes. Can you do an endo access through a fake tooth? Okay, I can do that too. And can you scale and root plane? Well, yeah, 
all right, you do all those things and now you're handed a dental license and now you're thrown into the world and you're seeing all these patients with TMJ problems, occlusal muscular issues with headaches, um, people that are destroying their dentition because of functional deficits that relate to everything I just talked about, people with airway problems, all these huge issues that cause us to lose confidence in what it is that we do, cause clinical failures, which decreases our profitability, and all these different types of situations when we can't get people out of pain, when we can't relieve their symptoms, or we're having um, failures in the dentistry that we're providing, those are the things that take away our predictability, take away our profitability, and we end up wanting to kind of hunker down in the corner and really practice this insurance-based model, which is one tooth at a time, because I don't want to get myself into an uncomfortable situation. Where the cure for that is to learn how to diagnose properly by doing a complete examination and taking that complete examination data and now transferring that into being able to treatment plan two-dimensionally, three-dimensionally, learn how to manage patients in their in prototypes and their provisionals that are our ability to control quality, to test out function, phonetics, and aesthetics. Right. And that's how we can get that predictability and we can get people into a higher level of health. But everything, Kirk, everything boils down to can you can you diagnose? Right. And can and can you allow the patient to take ownership of their situation? Right, because when you the more you know, I think you would pop, probably agree that the, the more complete you do dentistry, whether it be diagnosis, exam, dentistry, the less problems you have later, the less emergencies you have, the less teeth. You know, people always say, "Well, how do I get rid of emergencies on the weekend?" I'm like, "Well, that doesn't happen a lot with dentists that do complete exams." You know, you can tell them the tooth is going to break eventually and they go you told me it was going to break but if you don't do that we find the more complete up front the less problems you have on that side the other thing that you said and this is a great thing that pete taught all of us early on was that the more predictable dentistry is for your practice the happier everybody is you don't understand that a remake is very expensive well you might think in time no 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 my friends that is very expensive or crowns come back and you know the margins are off all that stuff is crazy expensive so it's always and we say this to patients all the time the least expensive way to do anything is to do it the right way the first time type of right. a thing so i think in the future even coming out of the pandemic whenever the heck this thing ends i mean dentists are going to have to get back to doing complete dentistry and really, like I said, setting the sales and, and making sure that, um, you know, patients are getting the best care in patient-centered dentistry. Well, if you want to differentiate yourself from other dentists, you know, our, our patients have been trapped into this model thinking that um, the standard of care for dentistry is based off of this insurance model. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they've been, they've been just brainwashed into thinking that. A lot of dentists, we've been the same thing has happened to us because we've kind of given up control of our profession to the to the, the whims and however the wind blows for for an insurance company but our patients they may not realize that a better standard of care is out there and right. one of the quickest ways to differentiate yourself and make yourself special within your community is by becoming a patient a dentist that can solve problems right right who who are the who are the wealthiest people and the most rewarded people in the world? Well, they're the people that can solve the biggest problem. You know why is Elon Musk a billionaire? Because he solved the problem of of making an electric car that people wanted to buy. Why is Jeff Bezos the richest man in the world? Because he solved the problem of giving people consumer products that they want as fast as possible and delivering it and making purchasing it as easy as possible. So make no mistake that if you can put yourself in a position, if you can gain the clinical skills to be able to solve more problems, you're going to benefit two ways. You're going to benefit financially, but you're also going to benefit from as a from being a dentist that can provide and get people to a higher level of health and that's just an absolute win-win and when when you get patients motivated the right way insurance just doesn't matter right right and with so many things that we're learning i, I feel like we're learning faster than ever you guys at the dust academy have completely been on the cutting edge as far as digital goes but like even with the 
hottest topics in dentistry. You got airway, you got inflammation, you got all these things. There has never been a more exciting time to be a dentist. And the learning just builds value for what you do. We say it all the time. There are people that fix teeth and there are people that change lives. Those are two completely different practices. Mm -hmm. But now's the time. I mean, can you ever remember a time that, that was this exciting to be a, a dentist? I, there just hasn't been. And um, even with, uh, I never even thought it, articulators would go on. I mean, who would ever dream that we'd have digital impressions? But they're here. You know what I mean? And it's crazy fun, a uh, lot more predictable, a lot more accurate. So um, I don't know. I just, I just think this is a great time for dentists more than ever. Well, it is. You know, it's there's. Um, it's definitely the most exciting time. If, if 21 years ago when I went into private practice, if you would have told me that I'd be practicing the way I am right now and using the techniques and using the technology that I use on a daily basis, I would have thought you're crazy. I would have tried to burn you at the stake because I never, the things that we're doing now, I didn't really think were going to be possible. Uh, and that's really exciting. But the, the, the other side of the coin for that is, that as a dentist now, that means that we have, it, it's on us to make sure that we're staying on the cutting edge, that we're, we're doing the CE that we need to do. We're doing the reading, the research, and, um, and making sure that we're, we're keeping ourselves in a position to maximize what it is that we're doing in our practices. And, you know, I'll, the best example that I can give anybody is when, when I got a cone beam CT in my practice and, oh my goodness, the, the difference that it made. Uh, my confidence level to be able to diagnose better, to be able to do joint scans, to be able to look at the airway volume, um, but also to find all the other pathology. Excuse me, I'll just get so chucked up talking about this. All the other pathology that's out there that we're so routinely finding on the cone beam CTs that before, if we didn't have the ability to 3D image, we would have just been missing this and we were missing it. Right. And just even that alone, what we've been able to do for people from a health standpoint, I'm not just talking about teeth. I'm talking about generalized health, sinus issues, finding Oral calcifications cancer. and carotid yes. arteries. I mean, finding other incidental pathology on there that it's just amazing the good that we can do for our, our patients. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So now other things, you know, I want, this is such an important topic right now in this day and age of dentistry. Number one, we never dreamed we'd be in this. I think everybody just wants to take that calendar of 2020 and rip it off and throw it away. But what else are you seeing? You know, if we, if we draw a line in the sand and you say these people are doing really well and these people are probably having a hard time. What are some other observations that you've seen on the road or just talking to dentists? Because you do a lot of webinars. Last night you were doing another webinar. Yeah. Um, you get to listen to them. Anything else come to, come to mind? Well, it's just a, it's just relationship. You know, the, the biggest thing that I always tell people is you're in the people business. Don't lose right. sight of that. Make sure that you you that's the most important thing that you recognize and also that your staff recognize is the importance to to rec to be in the people business. But um, you know, from the other side of it is, is confidence. Confidence is so important for a dentist. You know, I always tell, tell younger dentists when I meet with them, I tell them, they look, I said, a, a patient can smell a lack of confidence in a dentist like a dog can smell fear. And what do we need to do as dentists to have confidence? Well, one of the most important things that we need to do is have education, to be educated and, uh, to make sure that, um, that we're that we're educated in the right in the right areas and allowing us to confidently create treatment plans for patients. Yeah. And don't don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to educate your patient and don't be afraid to be rejected as well. You know, don't yeah. you're gonna you're gonna have a you're gonna you're gonna have a lot of people that turn you down and that's okay because maybe it's just not the right time or the right place for those patients. But you know, through diagnosis, you can plant those seeds of implication. And, and um, when you talk about when you when you're educating and, and, and planting those seeds of implication with your patients, when you paint a picture of what's going to happen in the future and then it happens, then you look like a genius because sure. you, pre you predicted what's going to happen. If you don't educate your patients about what the future will bring, then when something happens, whether it's a tooth that breaks or maybe, you know, you're, they have a temporomandibular joint that starts clicking and popping or becomes painful. Then it's just an isolated incident that happened to them. And, uh, and then, you know, you don't really get the benefit of, of looking smart that way. 
Yeah, I completely agree. You know, the education piece is so critical, not so much for the new information, but dentists need that to keep the fire lit. A lot of times when you go to education, it just keeps your fire going. I love being on anything with you guys because I'm like, darn, that was really good. You know, it's like it kind of reconfirms what we know or it gives us new perspective on what we don't know. And, you know, Pete used to say this and it was one of my favorite things he ever said to me at the age of 24. I said, Dr. Dawson, what's the one thing you would tell me as, as I look at and embrace a career of dentistry? He goes, don't ever tell yourself you have it all figured out. You know, <laughs> dentists that have it all figured out, they're not much fun. And number two, it's fun to, you know, be curious. He goes, heck, I learned from these young dentists all the time. And there was like 400 dentists in the room. It was the top, ten, how to put your practice in the top 10% type of thing. And you and I were talking about this before we went live. I think education is going to be like a hotbed of just where we all get back together. Um, as soon as we're able to travel again, I think we're going to come back even stronger. I can't wait to throw my first party in my house again, like we're talking about. But I think you're exactly right. As soon as we can get the meetings again, as soon as we can get in a room with other clinicians, I think we're going to completely take advantage of that. And you're, you guys are always seeing that trend, even at the DOS Academy, even now in the midst of travel restrictions or people not wanting to do this. Like yeah, we used no, to. We're, people are wanting to go back live. You know, make no mistake that there there is an energy when human beings get together. Right. Um, you know, if look, we all know that when when you if you have a favorite brand and you have songs or an album that you love, we all realize that typically, unless this band is phenomenal, and there's a few of them out there, when you go hear them live, it's always worse than what it is that you hear on a produced <laughs> record, right? But everybody still wants to go and hear a band live, right? Oh, because yeah. you you want to be consumed by the energy and the energy of the people around you. And we're, we're energetic creatures. And yeah. we like to be able to have that synergy that we sense when we're around other human beings that are experiencing something together. And live CE is the same way. You know, even if you, in our seminar one class, our functional occlusion course, you know, there are times when we have 250 people in that room. And when, when it is... It's amazing that the energy that you feed off of from the other people and how you learn in a different way. And at break time, you're meeting somebody new and you're talking about your challenges or maybe you learn something, a, a tip or a trick from somebody else that you just had a random conversation with. There's no replacement for that. Right. You know, there's no replacement for being able to look at somebody eye to eye instead of through a computer screen. I mean, thank God we have Zoom, but I can't wait to be talking with people not through a computer screen. <laughs> yeah, I hear you, especially if you're a hugger. You know, I'm like, yeah, hey, you're getting a hug whether you want one or not, mask or no mask, <laughs> which probably is always a problem. I, now I have to ask people, you know, I'm coming in for one and they'll go, no, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. You um, know, and there are people, I mean, you know, just even shaking hands and, and, and hugs, like you said, you know, you know, we need to have nice intimate interactions with people. We want to be able to express our appreciation through a hug or a handshake or, you know, grasping somebody and pulling and just bumping chest together like guys like to do these types of right. things. These are all important parts that we're really missing out on. And that human connection is so important. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I hate being in my practice right now and not shaking hands with my patient when I walk in the door. Mm -hmm. Having a mask on all the time, really, I'm tired. I'm so tired of this barriers right. that are between us. And I can't wait for us to get to the point where we don't have to do that anymore. And it's coming quickly. Yeah, I hope I, I hope and pray you're right now. I know you guys have a very generous offer for the Dawson Academy. But before we do that, and I'm just going to say, if you're watching this right now and you've never been, you got to go. You just got to go. And I promise you, you'll love it. But before we do that. You know, we've got a lot of young dentists right now. We got a lot of dental students watching. We have actually kids that are just thinking about dentistry that had joined. The kind of, like, what would you say to a young dentist? Maybe somebody who's just coming out of dental school. And, you know, I have these conversations all the time with associates that were working for big. Now they're unemployed and they got babies and they're like, oh, man, I don't know. But or if you're if you're a 32 year old dentist watching this, tell them, give them a good piece of advice. You know, what would you say to a 32 year old dentist looking at three more decades of this? Well, you know, I, what I would tell to a 32-year-old dentist is that, number one, you made the most amazing decision that you could make by going into dentistry. Awesome. Um, you know, we are so blessed in this country. You know, right now, there are, there are 5 billion people alive on this planet right now 
that are getting by on less than three dollars a day. So, you know, dentists made a, a series of amazing decisions in their life. You know, they're fortunate if we're if you're a dentist in the United States and, you know, you've, you've, you're in the, one of the greatest countries in the world. You've decided to do a profession to where, you know, globally speaking, you're going to be in the top one percent of earners in the world. And not only that, but you also have the ability to help other people. You have the ability to improve the health, the quality of life, the longevity of how many people in this on this planet get the opportunity to do that with their jobs. There's very few that do. So we're so blessed when it comes to the fact that we choose to, to do dentistry. And what I would tell you is what I would tell a 32 year old dentist is that the best years are ahead of you right. is that just keep learning, keep pushing your clinical knowledge that will grow your confidence and you are going to be able to become a problem solver in your community that there's plenty of room. There's, you know, when, when, when dentists will come up to me and they'll say, well, gosh, you know, you're out tech lecturing and teaching other people. Aren't you afraid you're creating competition for yourself? And I say, never. You know, there's ne it's, um, it's never a competition thing. There's plenty of people out there. There's plenty of teeth that need to be fixed. Right. But my job is to, is to help people to treat other people better. And that's awesome. one of the most important things. So take the opportunity that you have as a dentist and, and keep pushing yourself to get to a higher level. And what you're going to find is that eventually this is going to become the best hobby you ever chose. Because when you go to work and you love what you do, it's not work anymore you are just blessed to be able to do things that you enjoy doing. And that's, that's one of the greatest things about being a dentist. I love that you said that brother. This is, this is truly one of the greatest professions ever. I'm so lucky. I just stumbled into it, you know, and if you're a dentist, you pick the greatest profession ever. You just got to surround yourself with great people that help you help reinforce that getting around the wrong dentist can certainly reinforce it. The well, other look, way. It's, it's hard to soar like an Eagle when you're surrounded by chickens. That's so true. <laughs> we should get t-shirts with that. Now, I want you to tell people, you guys have been so gracious. You've always been good to the Act Dental community. You've got a great offer for people that might be on the fence or have been thinking about going to the Dawson Academy. You've got a great course coming. Is it October 8th? Is it October 9th and 10th. 9th and 10th. So okay. Days, so it's our Functional Occlusion 2020 and Beyond. Okay. And uh, it's a two-day course. It'll be taught by myself and Dr. John Cranham. Awesome. And we'll, you know, it's it's two days where I always tell people it's like the veil gets lifted off of mm -hmm. you. Like you see the world differently. You see the 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 practice of dentistry differently after you go through that class because so many of the things that you had no idea about or never or you'd maybe heard of concepts but you didn't actually understand them three-dimensionally it is the solution to what bewilders us as restorative dentists so much of it learning how to diagnose learning about function about the five requirements of occlusal stability about how do you how do you build a functional beautiful smile when form follows function all of these beautiful concepts that make us makes it easier for us to diagnose and to do dentistry more predictably and more profitably that's really the main part of this course is it just opens your eyes to so much potential out there so we're we're offering that course it's october 9th and 10th this is going to be the second time that we've done this class virtually in response to the covid pandemic and we're going to offer a special a special discount code uh, to listeners of uh, your podcast here of the best practices show. So if you go to the Dawson Academy website, the Dawson and you register for the class between now and midnight tonight, and you type in the discount code occlusion, O C C L U S I O N 599, you'll get a hundred dollars off. So the course is normally 699 and you'll be able to register for the course for 599 for a savings of a hundred bucks. Okay, so I'll add that up here. So it's go to the DawsonCabby.com. Occlusion599 is the course code. You guys can check it out. I highly encourage you to check it out. Uh, you will absolutely love it. And then also, so Doss, I, I'm going to recommend two things. Number one, Dawson Cabby. And I will say this about you. You gave me the greatest out-of-body experience continuing education could possibly ever offer. Uh, if you haven't been to one of Dr. Uh, Leonard Hess's uh, Napa Valley wine tours, it is truly, I mean, there's nothing. That's, that, is the, that is the Everest of experiences. <laughs> Not only do we get great CE, 
but you were saying to me, I'm, so we did a three day thing and it was like five grand for the whole fee. I mean, people were like out of their minds to go there. And the first day was at Silver Oak. And I'm like, good, this is unbelievable. He goes, oh, tomorrow's better. I'm like, it can't get any better than this. Then Friday, I'm like, yeah, today was better than yesterday. And then you go wait until Saturday. I'm like, I don't think my heart could take it. And then Saturday, I was like, I hope heaven looks like this. <laughs> so uh, when are I'm, you going to be doing those again? And we well, got to have you back to, to explain what that is. Like, Absolutely. Well, you know, it's uh, the... The 2020 version obviously got canceled, as you can imagine. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure it's going to happen in 2021 because, you know, for the time of year that we want to be out there, I would be having to uh, promote it already and be signing contracts for everything right now. So probably 2022 is going to be the next one, it looks like. All right. So there's just there's too much. But I'll tell you. Having to having to go through the difficulty with contracts when you have all this and in California, you know these companies, yeah. you know they 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 like to keep you locked in as you can imagine, and um, you know it's just too early to be able to to make those commitments for next year. We got to see how things go. All right, so I'm going to Valen told you for this. So when he announces the next one, you're going to hear it here first right. here. And it might be two years from now, but I'm going to tell you, I'm in, get, get locked in because it is an out of body experience. If you yeah. like wine, food and great education, there's no way to couple those three things better than the way you do it. It's amazing. I had, I had so many people registered for this year already that, that were registered. And when I told them it was canceled, they were so bummed out because they thought, oh, it's going to be my break after my first trip after yeah. COVID. And so, but I appreciate your support in that, uh, Kirk, and we'll, we'll make sure that we do a big big uh big reveal whenever the dates get announced for 2022 we do we will we will definitely do that so cool we'll stick around while we say goodbye to everybody i just really appreciate you being out we're gonna have you back again and again and again as you guys continue to do great stuff in the educational front so if you haven't checked it out dawson academy uh and the code for the upcoming course is occlusion 599 you get a hundred dollars off you will absolutely love it so be the best money you ever spent Ever, ever. And it'll come back as a huge return year over year over year. So um, if you enjoyed today, just do us a big favor, hit the share button and share it with your friends. Again, keep sending us suggestions for things that you want to see on upcoming shows. And until we see you next week, keep watching the best practices show. You guys enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.